Marais le Magnal is a beautiful, quiet town nestled in the center of France. But the power that emanates from this town is pure Holy Spirit. You can still feel the presence of our Lord Jesus, for it is here that our Lord appeared to a nun over a period of 17 years. He brought his faithful message of love to an unfaithful people who had grown cold. Here, he once again spoke of that tremendous love of his to become man and suffer death, even death on a cross. Margaret Mary lived in this convent as a visitation nun from 1671 to 1690. Our Lord appeared to her here many times. Not only were these revelations from our Lord Jesus accepted by the church, but because of the virtuous, selfless life of this nun, she was raised to the communion of saints in 1920. Over the years, our Lord Jesus shared with her, he desired the faithful to come to the foot of the altar, that great graces would be poured out from his sacred heart. He told her that from the time the angels proclaimed his incarnation to the triumph of the cross, his heart suffered constantly because of the sins of men from the beginning of the world. Right up until today. His greatest wound was apathy, the lack of respect for the blessed sacrament, his body and blood. And for that reason, he wanted a devotion to his sacred heart, which St. Margaret Mary instituted. Margaret Mary Alacoque was born in Charol, 20 miles outside paris le monial on July 25, 1647. Little did her family know when she was born how powerfully the Lord would use her one day, nor did they have any idea that she would be the instrument he would use to bring about devotion to his Sacred Heart and the Nine First Fridays. She was baptized three days after she was born in the little church in Charol. Margaret Mary was devoted to our Lord Jesus all her life. She spent much time under the influence of her godmother who taught her about her faith. At four and a half years old, she made a vow of perpetual virginity in front of a statue of Our Lady in her godmother's garden. She later wrote, without knowing what it was, I continually felt the need to say these words, Oh my God, I consecrate my purity to you. I did not understand what I had done or what the word vow meant either, any more than what chastity meant. My only desire was to hide in some forest. The first nine years of her life were filled with joy and a family steeped in spirituality, praying the rosary and going to mass together. This was to come to a devastating end when her father died. After his death, her whole family was left under the control of her father's brother. As their home was jointly owned by her father and her uncle, Margaret Mary, her mother, and her two brothers were forced into a life of servitude. Their uncle taking over full control of the property, his family treating them worse than servants. By the grace of God, Margaret Mary was sent away to the poor Clares of Charol, where at age nine she received First Holy Communion. Margaret Mary was strongly influenced by the nuns and the stories they told of the saints at the convent school she attended. Considering all nuns to be saints, she watched them closely, believing if she became a nun, she too would become a saint. The special time was to end for Margaret Mary when at age 11 years, she became ill and had to return to her home. She was struck down by a crippling rheumatism that would confine her to a bed for the next four years, bedridden, 
No sign of relief, recovery seeming hopeless, Margaret Mary prayed to the Virgin Mary. She made a vow. If Mother Mary would intercede for her to a son, she would someday become one of her nuns. She was immediately cured. To Margaret Mary, a vow to the Blessed Mother to be one of her daughters as a nun meant becoming a nun of the Order of the Visitation because these nuns were called daughters of Mary. But nine years elapsed before she asked for admittance to that order. What happened to the child who had made a vow to the Lord at four and a half years old? And the girl who had made a promise to Mother Mary to be one of her daughters? As with so many of us, she was healed through the intercession of Mother Mary. And then she went about her life enjoying her great health, not paying much attention to, if even remembering, the vow she made. But God had a plan for her, and he executed it. Margaret Mary had many temptations. Were the vows she took at age four binding? Would it be selfish for her to enter the convent when it meant leaving her mother to suffer never-ending humiliation, abuse, and servitude? Genuine problem was the love that Margaret Mary had for her mother. The devil plagued her with his, how will you be able to be separated from your mother? So Margaret Mary went out socially and obedience to the family and loyalty to her mother. She tried to enjoy herself at the parties she attended, but try as she may, she could not. For that voice within her heart spoke clearly and sternly to his future bride. Our Lord Jesus required much discipline of Margaret Mary. Once as a teenager, she took part in a masquerade during the carnival. Jesus appeared to a scourge from head to toe, ropes painfully rubbing against his hands. He told her that her vanity was the reason he suffered those wounds. Margaret Mary, to the end of her days, considered this one of her greatest sins. Margaret Mary wanted to be a saint. She had read the lives of the saints and thought that they had never sinned. Believing herself the greatest sinner, she used many harsh forms of mortification to make up for the sins that she felt she had committed when she had put human acceptance before her Lord's will. Our Lord Jesus came and chastised her, scolding her that she was doing her will and not his. For it was not his desire she practiced these extreme atonements for her sins. It's to remember always that he was the master of her soul, not she. Once Margaret Mary decided that she would enter the convent of the visitation, attacks began with a fury that made all other bouts with the devil seem like child's play. He taunted her with, poor wretch, you will never persevere. You don't have the stuff to be a holy nun. You and your family will be the laughing stocks of the village when you give up your habit and leave the convent. Although her mother never cried in front of her, everyone told her that her mother wept every time she spoke of Margaret Mary entering the convent. Well-meaning friends of her mother scolded. She would be the cause of her mother's death and that Margaret Mary would have to answer to God for abandoning her. Just as she was about to succumb to the attacks of the enemy and consider marriage, Mother Mary came to her and scolded her for weakening. Then our Lord came to her and reminded her of her, of her vow to him. One day after she received communion, our Lord showed himself to her as the handsomest, the wealthiest, the most powerful, the most perfect of all spouses. He asked her how, since she had been promised to him since childhood, she could think of going with another. Margaret Mary would never cease having problems. Even when her family finally accepted her resolve to become a nun, there was strife. They insisted she enter one religious community of nuns, and she was determined to enter the convent of the Visitation. After much struggle, she finally walked through the doors of the convent of the Visitation Sisters at paris le Magnal on June the 20th, 1671, to begin her life as a religious. She took her vows a year later on November the 6th, 
1672. During the 10-day retreat in preparation for this ceremony, Margaret Mary was praying in the garden of the convent. Our Lord Jesus appeared to her. He spoke gently, softly, instructing her in the mystery of his passion. It was the beginning of a very intimate relationship between Margaret Mary and our Lord Jesus. He was preparing her for great things. He told her, here is the wound in my side, so that you can make it your present and perpetual dwelling. There you will be able to preserve the robe of innocence in which I have clothed your soul, that you may live henceforth by the life of a God-man, as though no, you are no longer living, so that I may live perfectly in you. Before the day of the ceremony, on All Souls Day, Margaret Mary knelt before the Blessed Sacrament and begged the Lord's forgiveness for all the times that she had betrayed him. She then offered herself as a sacrificial victim to him, her divine master. In reply, our Lord said, remember that it is a crucified God you intend to wed. That is why you must conform to him by bidding farewell to all the pleasures of life, for there will be no more pleasures for you except those of the cross. On November the 6th, 1672, having made her vows, Margaret Mary said these words. I belong forever to my beloved. I am forever his slave, his servant, and his creature, since he is all mine, and I am his unworthy spouse, Sister Margaret Mary, dead to the world. Everything from God and nothing from me. Everything God's and nothing for me. With those words, she became Sister Margaret Mary nun, bride of Christ, and future saint. One of the greatest blessings Sister Margaret Mary received after her profession was that now she was able to see Jesus, her spouse, to feel him close to her, to hear him more clearly than when she had seen and he heard him solely with her heart. She could not bear to turn away from Jesus, even for a moment. His presence, his real presence, was so visibly before her. Sometimes I wonder, do we really believe that Jesus' real presence is before us, his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Blessed Sacrament, after our priest says the words of consecration? He is present in the tabernacle or exposed in a monstrance. Do we spend an hour with him in Eucharistic adoration? Do we believe? He promised never to leave me, saying, Always be ready and eager to receive me, for I want to make my dwelling in you to converse and talk with you. Is this not what our Lord says to us as he opens his arms and hearts to us, his heart to us every day in his Eucharist? On the vigil of the Feast of the Visitation, Margaret Mary was in choir with the rest of the nuns. They were singing Te Deum. Margaret Mary had a loss of voice. She couldn't sing with them. All at once, the baby Jesus appeared in her arms. Her voice returned, and she sang with the rest in glory of our Lord. When Margaret Mary became mistress of novices, her sorrow turned to joy when she came upon her novices, kneeling before an image of the sacred heart which they had made and placed on the altar of the oratory. On another occasion, while the other sisters were present in the yard, Margaret Mary had a vision of the sacred heart of Jesus surrounded by seraphic angels. The angels made a pact with Margaret Mary at that time. They would suffer with her. She, in turn, would rejoice with them. This special shrine has been renamed the Yard of the Seraphim. <laughs>